Hello everyone and welcome to get episode number 252 of Goulet Q&A. Uh, it's going to be a good one today. I'm going to have to make it a good one because I am going to be bailing on you next week. I'm going to be out of town. But before I get into that, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the cult of new, defending your pen costs to strangers, and when I'm willing to fire a customer, among other things. I've actually packed in 10 questions for you today, and I'm going to try to roll through them because I have to be out of here in less than an hour, so <laughs> I've got to go. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be out of town next week because Rachel and I are taking a family vacation to Disney World. So we're very pumped about that. The kids are super excited. We are pretty excited. I'm going to eat very well. I'm going to walk a lot. It's going to be hot. We're going to be tired. The kids are going to be excited. And now they're too big to fit in strollers too, so they're going to be walking all the time. I'm assuming crankiness will happen. Uh, if not on the kids' part, then maybe on mine. So it'll just be a very interesting experience. But uh, anyway, we're very excited about that. So that means I'm just not going to be here all week to shoot a QA. and a I apologize. But this should be the last of travel for a little bit. I've really traveled a lot this spring. Um, but anyway, this should be kind of the last of it for a little bit. Um, this past weekend, Rachel and I were at a wedding in New York. It was about an eight-hour drive from where we are. I talked about it in the personal message this week, but... Um, her cousin got married. It was like drive up all day Friday. We were there Friday night and Saturday, left on Sunday morning, driving back about eight hours. So it was a lot of driving, but it was great to see her family, really good people uh, up there. Cool to get to see. It was a lot of family we hadn't seen in years, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then it's just been pretty quiet around here uh, in terms of like new product launches and things like that. Had a few things here and there, but um, you know, April's kind of wound down just a little bit for us as we finished out the month. Got a couple of things that have come in uh, and a couple of things that are new that I wanted to mention. Uh, one of them is uh, a new Aurora pen. So this is uh, just came in this week, the Aurora Natuno, the 88 Natuno. And it's part of their Cento series. So they're coming out with a bunch of different pens to commemorate their 100th anniversary. And we got a Q&A question on that today as well. Uh, but I just wanted to show it to you because it's new and because the color looks incredible. So let me open this up. So it comes in a pretty substantial box if you're not familiar with it already, but here it is. And if it's not confusing enough, there is an Italian pen brand called Natuno, not related at all, but this color of this pen is called Natuno. Um, let me take off a little, little dingle dongle here. here. There we go. So this color is absolutely awesome. It's a nice teal color. It's a quartz-like color, uh, and it looks really, really good. Uh, it's got an 18 karat nib, uh, extra fine through broad, piston filling mechanism. It's, it's, it's basically an Aurora 88 pen, but they made 888 of them, and they're going to, uh, you know, have them as long as they have them, and then that's it. Um, very cool pen. If you're familiar with the Aurora 88, uh, it's just a variation of that. And I'm going to try to get this thing back on here. I might just have to do it later. There we go. Uh, but anyway, gorgeous material, gorgeous pen, uh, rhodium trim, looks really nice. Special box, it's pretty rad. Boom, boom, boom. So that's happening, um, $795 for that pen. No, sorry, $805.50 for that pen, uh, $895 MSRP, but that's what we have. Uh, also have a new pen that I'm very excited about. This one is an exclusive of ours from Stipula. And there's a bit of a story behind this one, but this is called the Etruria Alter Ego. And this is a celluloid material that uh, was made about 20 years ago. And it looks, it looks like granite, doesn't it? Just the, the veining that you see in here, the specific, um, you know, kind of black with a hint of red around the edges that runs through these orange, you know, kind of quartz looking, um, you know, chunks of celluloid in here. Uh, the color looks phenomenal. And actually this is a, a pen that I've seen before. I actually shot a video on this like seven years ago. Uh, we had gotten a special order for a previous version of this, which was around at the time. And I held it in my hand and I was so infatuated with this pen that I actually shot a video on it, even though it wasn't something we were regularly carrying. It was the only one that I ever saw at the time. Uh, but anyway, you can still look at it. It's still out there on the internet, on YouTube. But we went to Stipula 
last year in September uh, to their factory. I saw these rods there. They only have a certain number of rods left. This material is not made anymore, so you can't get it. Basically, that what they have, the small stock that they have, is all that there ever will be again. And so they really don't want to let it go. But I basically begged and pleaded and pulled every string that I could in order to get some pens made out of this. So I'm a big fan of the Etruria size pen. Um, it's got a celluloid grip, nice balance to it. It's a piston filling pen with over two milliliter ink capacity. It has a 14 karat gold nib, and these are nibs that Stipula makes themselves in their factory, which are good quality. I got to see them making some of these nibs. They have these like old machines from like the 50s that are really cool when they make these nibs, uh, all handmade in Italy. So it's pretty cool story behind it. Um, very vintagey kind of feel to it. Uh, and we only have 88 of these pens and that will be it. So they are 7.95. We have extra, ultra extra fine, extra fine, fine, medium, broad, and a 1.1 millimeter stub. So I haven't written out with every single one of these nibs because it is a new, it's a new bit basically nib um, that we haven't really had before. So we're gonna nib nick them and have them up on the site. Um, but I think we're launching them today as of the launch of this video, um, unless something absolutely crazy happens and then it'll be early next week. But that is the plan is that they'll be launched today. So you'll have them on the site uh, and you can uh, check them out there. So. There you go. Um, there was a slight change in our Diplomat Aero Blue. Um, it's really difficult actually to anodize aluminum. And uh, when we noticed that the next batch of them that came was slightly darker, dark enough where we thought we should um, change them. So we've communicated to Diplomat about this. They are working on consistency with that, but there was a slight shift dark enough. I actually like the new darker color a little bit better because it's more like <laughs> my favorite Goulet Blue. Uh, but anyway, we updated our pictures on our site. So if you're buying a Diplomat Aero Blue now, it's gonna be just a little bit darker. And then some things that are coming soon, we have the Visconti Homo Sapiens Magma. So it's an updated, you know, basically version of the Homo Sapiens with some red trim. Pretty cool, I think it looks really sharp. So if you like that black and red, very much of like a, you know, um, automotive kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I clearly don't know my sports terms, but if you're into like automotive racing and stuff, it's got that kind of vibe to it, I guess, uh, that kind of industrialized look. So it looks pretty cool. Um, and then also we're gonna have Opus 88's uh, extra fine nibs relatively soon as well. We're just kind of waiting on those to come in, but I think it's on the horizon. So there you go. Um, got a bunch of questions for you this week, so I'm going to keep a pretty steady pace. So please settle in, grab yourself a nice cup of coffee or maybe a drink or maybe, I don't know, bowl of popcorn or something, whatever you like to do when you sit down and do Q&A. Maybe you're cleaning your pens. And if so, I'm gonna pack your brain full of knowledge. So here we go. First question I have, these are all pen and writing questions. First one is Mentat V on Facebook. Brian and team, I have a couple questions that you may have already answered, in which case, sorry for repeating them. Why aren't many colored nibs and feeds around? I get that the gold nibs and feeds need to reflect the gold, but nibs, steel nibs are almost always limited to black, gold, or silver. Why not have colored feeds that match the color of the pen? Most manufacturers don't make ebonite feeds anymore, so why not shake things around a little? Are you aware of any technical problems with this? Cheers and thanks for the videos. All right, Mentat, you asked me quite a few questions in here, so I'm gonna try and hit them all. Um, so colored nibs, not as easy to do as you would think. Part of it has to do with durability. Um, so one pen that I can think of that used to have a colored nib that does not anymore um, was a Platinum Preppy. This is one, I actually don't have many of these because it's been a couple of years since they've done this. Um, but this is one, it was a red one and it had a red nib. Uh, and it was fine, but basically everybody bought black. Maybe a little bit of blue or something like that, but the colored ones were not nearly as popular. So I think that's part of it. I think part of it too has to do with um, the actual durability and the manufacturing process of coloring these nibs. So, you know, over the years, fat pens have around, been around for about 150 years. Over the years, they have basically determined what are some of the best materials to use for fountain pen nibs because it's pretty well tried and tested. Stainless steel is definitely one of them. Gold is another. Gold, you're kind of limited because not that much will adhere to gold. You can electroplate it and that's kind of it. You know, there's a couple of other methods you can do that I'll talk through, but basically any finish, if you want to get on really on gold or stainless steel, you're kind of limited. Stainless steel, you can, you can do some colored coatings on it, 
but it's not going to be as durable as electroplating. Electroplating is the most durable um, of the methods that I've seen used with nibs. Uh, you can, you know, electroplate gold to look, you know, with rhodium. So you can basically electroplate one metal onto another, um, but you can't you're limited by what natural metal colors there are. So you can work with ruthenium, which is a kind of a gunmetal color, or sort of close to black. Uh, you can do, you know, rhodium on top of gold. You can do gold on top of stainless steel. Um, but you don't have all the options in the world with electroplating. It's very durable. It's pretty cost efficient, but it's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of abuse that comes with stra scratch resistance and um, ink resistance too, because the ink is, is uh, you know, gonna, just the ink flowing through um, can debond uh, some uh, finishes on a nib. Uh, black nibs are kind of their own little special case because you're usually talking about PVD or a black oxide. Ruthenium kind of gets you there, but if you want the true black, PVD and black oxide are the two methods that are typically used. They're pretty darn durable, not quite as much as electroplating, but they will get you pretty close. Um, but any bright, like non-metal colors, it's really going to be have to be some kind of finish coating. Like basically it's like sort of like a form of paint or lacquer or something like that. It's just not going to hold up as well. It's not going to bond as well as a PVD black oxide or an electroplating. So that's part of it. Uh, is you just part of it I think is popularity. It's a bunch of extra steps and it's just not as durable. Um, so I haven't seen a whole lot of colored nibs. You will see rose gold because that's again a form of metal. Um, but not seeing a whole lot of others, I would be curious to see if you could have blue nibs and other things that would hold up. That would be interesting to me, but I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of them out there. Um, feeds are a different story. They could technically be just about any color. Um, ebonite, of course, you could have different colored ebonites. They're going to be more or less black with a little bit of color to it. They are, all tend to be pretty dark. Um, that's technically possible for anyone that's manufacturing a feed out of ebonite. Not that many companies are doing that. Um, Aurora, for example, you know, uses a red ebonite feed in a lot of their pens. Uh, you know, Namiki, they will sometimes have like a Yurushi coating on top of their feeds that make it like a red uh, color, but that's that's a coating that's on top of it. Obviously, it's a lacquer. Um, most other companies, though, is black. Every now and then, you'll see a clear feed, uh, but it's usually just black. I think part of that is it's super practical. It's not going to stain. It's, uh, and it's just, it just kind of blends in. Not a lot of people look at a feed and they're like, yeah, the feed is the reason I'm buying this pen. Though I know some pens, uh, the feed is, stands out a little more than others. Um, so yes, you have the m fact factor. Um, you know, I'd be curious, there's one company called Flexible Nib Factory here in the US that does make like small batch m feeds for a bunch of different pens. I would be curious if they could use some colored m Probably could be done. Um, but they're kind of a one-off. There's not a lot of people that are like manufacturing small batches of MA feeds for specific pens. Um, plastic feeds, you really could make the color just about anything you want. Um, but I, again, I don't think it's going to be super universally appealing. You know, whenever you're talking about making something that specialized like that, uh, it's going to have to be done in a pretty large quantity. So I don't know how many people would want a yellow feed or something like that. Um, so it's really going to boil down to that. I think a lot of manufacturers, it's just, you know, not not the forefront thing on their mind. They're going with something that's more kind of generic. Really, in, you know, black pens have been the most popular color for like, I don't know, since they existed. Um, so that tends to match better. Black tends to just universally match more pens. So, you know, I think you would just have to buy like a stupid high quantity of any colored feed that you would have done. Most manufacturers aren't even making their own feeds. You know, you have specialists that make feeds that a lot of other people use, especially if you know you have a more generic nib that's being sourced out too, like from a Bach or Yovo or something like that. These feeds are being mass, 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 mass produced. So um, it's not that it couldn't be done, but I think it's just not super practical in the grand scheme of things. But it's possible, I suppose. More possible probably than a colored nib. So there you go. That's what I know. That's the end of what I know. Made a few assumptions, but uh, I feel pretty confident about them. All right. Ian S. on Facebook says, are breather holes required? I remember on a previous write on that either Drew or Brian mentioned that they were not required. So why do some pens have them and some pens not? So yeah, Drew and I talked about that last week. Right now, I think is a lot of people call it right on. It's right now, technically, is the name of the show. Um, they aren't required. It's true. I mean, if you look at a Lamy pen, for example, um, that one doesn't have a nib. So that is not a good example. Um, Lamy pen. Uh, this one does have it, but not all of them have. Interesting. 
Oops. I'm missing nibs on a lot of my pens. Um, so they will sometimes not have them. Uh, Platinum Preppy, for example, that I just showed you, does not have a breather hole. Um, it's not really required, uh, and that is true. Noodler's pens don't have them. Uh, the Traveler's pen, to name a few. Uh, do I have my Traveler's pen on me? No, I don't. I can't show you that. Um, but yeah, and I've been told this by a number of manufacturers and nibmeisters and stuff like that, that the breather hole, which is, you know, basically the hole, here I'll show you. This one is an example on the stipula here, um, if I can get you close up on it. But the breather hole is just a little hole that's right here at the end of the slit. Uh, and it's really, it really doesn't really serve much of a function other than aesthetically. It just gives a nice place for the slit to end. And then uh, it has a nice stopping point. It's mainly aesthetic. Um, I'm sure to some small degree it may affect ink flow, but I don't think it's significant enough to really matter uh, in and of itself whether it's there or not. I think if you had a huge breather hole, yeah, it might impact it. Um, but that, that tiny little hole, I don't think it's really doing anything. It just gives a nice place, a nice stopping point for when they're, they're cutting the slit uh, in that nib, just in that step of the process. It gives them a specific place to stop because otherwise when you had one pen to another, you might stop in different places depending on, you know, there's a lot of handwork involved. So that just gives a nice place for that to finish and end off there. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's just something that I actually didn't even realize until just a couple of years ago that it wasn't actually required. So yes, that is the case um, as far as I know. And uh, yeah, GKS Chick 112 on Instagram says, I would like to know how Brian would respond to a scenario that recently happened to me. I was discussing my fountain pen hobby with a friend who is interested and supports it. He mentioned the cost of a pen I was holding. Another coworker overheard and said, OMG, $120 for a pen? I'd rather feed my family. That is snarky. Uh, I didn't know what to say. What would you have said? By the way, I do feed my family. LOL. Uh, okay, GKS chick, I have no doubt that you don't withhold food from your family for the sake of your pens. If so, um, any of you out there, if that's your scenario, your priorities are severely out of whack. But um, I do get this all the time, even with me being in the business. You can just imagine I carry around pens that are way more than $120 on a regular basis, or even I'm just I'm talking about it. A lot of times if I'm talking about people, especially in the business world, I'll talk to them about fountain pens. Oh yeah, we got a huge price range, all that. And people always ask, what's the most expensive pen you've ever sold? You know, which of course uh, can really get up there, especially when you get into limited editions and these types of things. Um, but honestly, I'll get this even with a 15 or a $20 pen. Like I'll have a Pilot Metropolitan or a Lamy Safari. And you know, some people in their world, you know, a pen like a, you know, a Diplomat Magna, even, you know, people would, you show this and you're like, yeah, it's $20. And people are like, $20 for a pen? They're like, that's crazy. I didn't even know they made pens that expensive. And you're like, you should see some of the other pens I have, you know? Um, but so first off, whoever, whoever your coworker was that made the I'd rather feed my family statement, that's a pretty judgmental statement right there. Uh, and so I wouldn't look to defend that one too, too much because they're probably just gonna dig in even deeper on that one. I would try to roll, more just like roll off that one. I've had that sometimes, um, but I don't really try to justify it. I usually just say, yeah, that's right. You know, it's just kind of my weird thing or whatever. And I don't really go beyond that because if somebody's that flabbergasted, um, then they probably don't really wanna hear, don't really wanna learn that much about it. They're just doing that as a way to kind of deflect. So I wouldn't really stress on that too much. Uh, but if you want to engage a little bit, you know, with somebody and you sense that there's some like actual curiosity as to $120, like really? Like that's fascinating. Tell me more about that. You know, that kind of vibe. Um, that's when I'll usually go like, yeah, you know, there's uh, actually, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, there's a lot of design and craftsmanship and these pens will last an entire lifetime and all this kind of stuff. These aren't disposable pens. You know, this is, you know, everybody's got their kind of weird hobby. This one's mine. If you really think about it, um, you know, and you can reiterate to them like, yeah, I, I feed my family, they're doing just fine. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. But it's like, think about it, like, you know, if you know anybody that golfs, $120 is like a one green fee on a decent golf course. Um, you know, if you know anybody that uh, eats out, you know, at expensive restaurants, like that could be one nice meal for two at a decent restaurant. Um, it's far less than a nice watch or nice shoes or designer clothing or anything like that. And people will justify $120 on a pair of designer jeans in a heartbeat 
but then on the same token, you'll mention your pen and they'll be like, that's crazy. And you're like, well, your genes are crazy. Like, come on. You know what I mean? So it's just whatever people's weird thing is, we all justify things ourselves. Um, and then when we take one step over and look at somebody else, we're like, okay, my thing is completely justifiable, but your thing is crazy. Um, you know, <laughs> so I wouldn't really sweat it too much. They just, they just don't get it, you know, and they don't have to. It's your thing. You don't have to convince the whole world that your hobbies are, you know, justifiable to everyone. That's the thing about a niche hobby, a niche interest like this, is if it's worth it to you, if it brings you joy, if it makes you happy, and if you think it's worth it, then it really doesn't matter what your coworker thinks. That's kind of where I go with it. I know there's different dynamics to it, and some of that, you know, they may hassle you about it all the time, in which case you could just talk to them and be like, hey, look, really, you're giving me a hard time about this. Can you please just drop it? You know, there's probably some other kind of issue that they've got <laughs> around that if they're, you know, being that judgy towards you about it. But that's a whole other thing. We're not trying to get into psychologist therapy type stuff here. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, you just enjoy it. Don't worry about it too much. And um, I think for just as many people as there are that would be like, kind of like, oh, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Other people would be like, huh, interesting. That's really fascinating. Tell me more about that. So there you go. Candace B on Facebook says, I need to catch up on a few Q and A's, so I apologize if it's already been answered, but could Brian show the Lamy Lux gold pen next to the new bronze all-star so we can see the difference in color? Right now, only compared past all-stars, which doesn't help me because I don't have any of the ones they talked about. Okay, cool. Candace, I'm happy to do this. Uh, maybe it's just because you called it right now instead of right on, and most everybody calls it right on. <laughs> I just really appreciated that. Uh, but anyway, uh, I wanted to show it also because I have, I don't think I showed the Lux uh, next to the, the Bronze All-Star. So I just wanted to give you a quick glance. This will be a, a quick one. Uh, but anyway, so this is the Bronze All-Star right here. It's a nice blend between kind of a gold and an orange. Uh, I've got some other pens here too, some of the ones that I did compare. Uh, this is the uh, Pearl All-Star, uh, special edition from a couple of years ago. This is the Lux in gold right here. So you can see right here, I have the um, bronze and then the gold Lux. This is the copper orange all-star, which is much more orange. And then this is the raspberry. This is definitely more of a kind of pinkish red, but I thought it was nice to kind of throw in the mix as well. So I wanted to give you a nice glance of all of these, try and get some of this glare off of there so you can see what's going on. Um, but specifically comparing these two, um, I do think it's, it's uh, Definitely more orange, not as orange as copper orange. Um, and then of course the price is lower on the bronze all-star, there you go. Uh, you're dealing with a metal component here on the top. This is a gold plated, uh, you know, finial that you've got and a gold plated clip on the Lux. The Lux is going to have a black nib as opposed to a silver nib that you'll have on the bronze. And then of course the packaging is a little different too. You're gonna have more of your typical cardboard packaging for your all-star and then the Lux is going to come in this aluminum tube which looks pretty awesome uh, though it's not necessarily um, you know central to the use of the actual pen but it is pretty darn cool so hope that helps you out if you're ha if you're having to make any decisions one way or the other um, the gold is definitely just more of like a pure straight up gold it's almost like a matte gold of sorts um, and then that bronze just has a twinge of orange to it. Cool. All right, Stephen G on YouTube says, how did big historical events of the last century like World War II affect the development of fountain pen technology, industry, etc.? It's hard not to notice that most, if not the best pens are coming from Germany, Italy, Japan. I think I've posted this question for Q&A several times before and maybe you guys thought I was joking, but no, I was not, ha ha. All right, Stephen. You've been persistent. Um, I wasn't intentionally not answering your question, to be quite honest with you. Um, but uh, I can touch on this a little bit. I will say I'm not a history buff. I'm not going to be the person to answer this question the most thoroughly. So I'm going to leave you falling short. I may even say something uh, slightly wrong. I apologize about that. Believe me, I'm intimidated to take a question like this because I know that there are other people in the fountain pen world that know way more about this than I do. In fact, anybody who's more into vintage pens history and industry and economics and all that is almost part of the package when you're getting the vintage pens. That's really 
kind of the appeal is you really cross over into that deep, deep knowledge uh, and history and stuff like that. I have a pretty bad memory, so when it comes to history, I have never been an expert. I usually go more for interpretation and broader themes than I do for exact dates and historical facts and regurgitation of knowledge. Um, I didn't do, I mean, I did okay in school, but uh, it was not, definitely not like my single strength. So I'm gonna leave you falling short here a little bit, but I'll give you the best uh, that I can with the question that, with the time that I had to think about it and research it. Anyway, um, so there you go. Uh, first off, couple of resources. Richard Binder has a lot of knowledge in this area. His website is very comprehensive about pen history and he's got a lot of knowledge just of history in general. He's actually written several eBooks on pens and World War II and various types of history and, and all this kind of stuff. He's got a good number of resources. So I would look up him. He's a great guy, very knowledgeable person in the pen industry. There's a lot of other people too. Forgive me, I don't know everybody in the pen industry, especially in the vintage world, but there's a lot of other vintage people that have a lot of knowledge in the pen world too about history stuff. Um, I do have a couple of books that can maybe touch on this a little bit. Doesn't exactly hit on your question, but it can certainly lean some into it if you're super interested in pens and history in general. Andy Lambrow has a couple of books. Uh, we sell them, The Fountain Pens of Japan and Fountain Pens of the World. Uh, so you can check those out. There's a lot of knowledge in there. It's more about the pens themselves and the brands than it is about like broader world history. Um, but those are a couple of options there. And then I actually have personally collected a number of books over the years. Um, I have 100 Years of Schaefer, uh, which is actually, the, it covered a bit of history in there too, which I'll touch on a little bit of that. I have a Pelican book that's Pelican the brand. This really just talks about like their branding, like their marketing and logos and stuff. Um, that one, not so helpful in terms of your question here. Um, I had the 100 year timeline of platinum fountain pens. This actually I just got this week, um, which is pretty fascinating. And uh, you know, platinum just hit their 100th anniversary this year. So they came out with that. These are not, other than the Andy Lambrow books, none of these are available for sale, unfortunately. They're just ones that I've collected, um, but you can at least kind of maybe source them out if you're familiar with the, the titles and stuff. Um, I have a Conklin legacy book, Alfonso Mur Mirbohigas. There we go. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, this one is pretty interesting. Really just talks about the pen history. Doesn't talk about world history at all, um, but it talks about Conklin history. And then I have this other one, uh, Esterbrook, a dip pen legacy by Brandon McKinney. This one, uh, you know, I didn't really uh, read through this one too, too, too much because it's really talking about like dip, dip nibs like calligraphy nibs, not so much fountain pens. Uh, and those are the books that I have on hand. Um, so I browsed through those a little bit. I assembled some of what I could remember from my own uh, world history uh, kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, those are some resources I have. So obviously some of the most impactful things, I think really a lot of history happens in the first half of the 20th century. You got World War I, the Great Depression, World War II. There was a lot happening in there that affected the whole world. Obviously Germany, Italy, Japan, US, UK, France, all of those were big fountain pen um, important countries. And there's a lot of companies that were involved, the wars and various economy you know, factors going on there impacted a lot of different companies there. Some of the broader themes, I think, you know, you had a fountain pen technology that was really coming into its own in like the 10, 1910s and 20s. Uh, and that's when you had, you know, Roaring Twenties, the Industrial Revolution. There was a lot of that that was happening. And you basically had um, expansion of, you know, technology and communication and being able to carry around a pen that didn't require an inkwell was like the smartphone of the day back in the early 19, the 1900s. So uh, the fountain pens were a really um, iconic kind of tool for freedom, communication, business, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that was a big part of it. And there was a lot of technology. There was a lot of chemistry and, and just science and technology and all that that was happening around that time. So there were a lot, a lot of, I mean, just the patents that were coming out for feed designs and different pen filling mechanisms and all that were just like boom, 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 right around that time. Um, that's where a lot of the groundwork is laid for modern fountain pens. Uh, and then, you know, these tools were very much in demand. So, uh, you know, pretty much everybody was looking to use a fountain pen because the alternative was like a quill or a dip, a metal dip nib. Um, so fountain pens were really pretty, pretty uh, snazzy at the time. Um, you know, obviously World War I was a big factor, the depression, you had huge impacts on labor, you had huge impacts on, you know, discretionary income. Uh, and then once you had the wars, especially World War II, um, you had 
you know, huge impacts globally on um, labor supply, demand, uh, and then supply of raw materials too, just supplies of metals uh, and various like rubbers and things like that that uh, were needed for the war effort. So uh, that impacted things. In fact, you know, I saw in the Schaefer book, it was talking about how like they encouraged retailers at the time to basically take down pre-orders or do like a waiting list for people that wanted pens because even if they wanted pens, there weren't the raw materials to actually make them. Um, so it was interesting just kind of what that happened. And then of course, after World War II ended, that shifted some things, um, you know, specifically like I know um, that uh, both Pilot and Platinum changed their names after World War II because they basically didn't want such Japanese sounding names around that time. They didn't say that specifically, but that was kind of read between the lines what happened. So Pilot, um, you know, changed their name to Pilot from Namiki. Uh, and then of course, now they have both Pilot and Namiki. Namiki's kind of their higher end Machie line. Um, but it used to be all Namiki and they changed it to Pilot. And then Platinum uh, used to be uh, Nakaya Seisakusho, and they changed that to uh, platinum right after World War II. So just interesting uh, changing some of the, just even just the perception of having a Japanese sounding name because they didn't want that to, uh, to you know, hinder the growth of their company there. Um, so there's lots of interesting history here. Fountain Pen Network can be a good resource too. I know there's a lot of like fountain pen uh, by country kind of things going on there. So that can be a good resource as well. There's all kinds of blogs and stuff. I think Fountain Pen Network and Richard Minder sites can be two really good sources to find other sources as well because they might link to other places. Um, they could be really good. Um, but in, another interesting thing about just history in general is, you know, once World War II kind of ended, that obviously shifted a lot. The economies of, you know, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, US, all that, to, you know, had to recover from all that. Then you had the baby boom, at least in the US, that happened after that. That affected a lot. There was a lot of um, discretionary income that came after that. And then you also had the rise of the ballpoint, which at that point in technology, the ballpoint came out in like the 40s, 50s, it started to become a little more reliable. And then the 50s and 60s, it started to become really reliable, mass produced, and it started to really put a hammer to fountain pens. And that kind of changed fountain pens itself. So you started to have the technology itself started, you know, just building upon itself and fountain pens then actually kind of went out of their heyday uh, a little bit post-World War II. So um, just really interesting, fascinating history that is intertwined with industry and, and uh, fountain pens themselves. So really fascinating thing. That's about as much as I've really explored it. I'm Forgive me if I was ignorant or said anything incorrect here, um, but I think uh, if you're interested in learning more, there are some resources out there, but um, you're gonna have to do a little bit of digging. But if you're into that kind of stuff, you might enjoy the process of finding this information. Um, but anyway, lots of disinteresting stuff for you there. All right, next question. This is from uh, Mualamin on Instagram. Uh, I was wondering why Aurora as a brand isn't mentioned more. I, men I mean, isn't there centennial <laughs> Sorry, I mean it's their centennial year, and I know you mentioned it a couple of Q&As ago, but nowhere near as much as Namiki Pilot or Platinum. Ironically, I just mentioned those brands in the last one. Is it a business strategy on Aurora's or your part? Is the brand not as hot as other Italian pen makers, such as Visconti or Panida, etc.? I'm curious about it because Aurora is my favorite Italian brand, and I might be totally wrong, but somehow I feel it doesn't get as much attention as the others. Why is that? Um, well, you know, thankfully, uh, I do have a new Aurora to show you here uh, with the Natuno, uh, but, you know, I think part of it is just Aurora in general doesn't have the same presence in the United States as some of these other ones. Um, some of that might just be because their focus is not necessarily here as much. I know that that's something that they are starting to pay more attention to. Um, they largely have had some of the same pen models for some time. So they have actually built up a very loyal following uh, over the last 10 or 20 years. And then they haven't been coming out with as much kind of different stuff, different new stuff. Certainly as, uh, well, Panida is relatively new to the pen scene, so almost everything they're coming out with now is new. Uh, and then Visconti as well has come out with a ton of new models and new colors and things like that. They're, they're coming out with newer stuff faster than basically anybody else. Um, and especially in the US, there's not as much awareness around fountain pens in general. So what we've seen is a trend here at Goulet Pens, at least, because we haven't been around for decades, all the customers that we've acquired in the last 10 years have been new to us. So uh, that's 
so much of that, our focus is like new stuff. Um, and brands that have tend to be on awareness uh, have a lot of new things that are coming out because it's just more natural to talk about. People get more excited about it, especially those who aren't as familiar with the brand. New stuff tends to get people's attention. Uh, that's part of it. I think part of it too is the price point. Uh, Aurora, a lot of their pens, you know, it's a new pen like the Aurora, you know, great. Okay, Cento, cool. Oh, 100th anniversary, great. I want to celebrate that. Oh, it's an $800 pen. Okay, most people, it's completely out of their budget. Uh, a lot of people who are really bought and sold on Aurora, it's your favorite brand. You're like, that's great. I love the 88. I know that's my favorite pen model. I'm going to get that uh, because I love the color and I want to celebrate Aurora's 100th. That's cool. But, you know, 888 pens worldwide, that's actually a decent number of pens, quite honestly. Uh, but they have other ones where it's like 88 pens worldwide, worldwide, for their 100th anniversary. And it's like, that's just not that many pens for like the mass markets to really be aware of. So I think a lot of it has to do with they've come out with kind of some more specialized stuff or really kind of catered to people that already kind of know about Aurora and uh, haven't done as much like trying to bring completely new brand new people into the fountain pen world. I know that's something that, you know, Kenro, Aurora's distributor in the U.S., has been talking to them about that and trying to come out with it. That's why you saw like the Minerali series when they came out with the 88 Minerali. They came out with a bunch of different colors to try to be coming out with new things to keep things a little more interesting. Um, it ended up kind of getting stacked on top of each other. <laughs> And even still, the price was still a little prohibitive for a lot of people. So I think they're still trying to find where that rhythm is in the U.S. I think they have a really loyal following worldwide, really loyal following in Europe and, and other parts of the world. Uh, but in the U.S., it just isn't as much on everybody's awareness as some of the other brands. You know, if you look at like Platinum and Pilot, they have a lot of pens in that really accessible, you know, like the Platinum Preppy is like one of the go-to new fountain pen user pens, you know, because it's four or five dollars, it's so accessible. You know, Pilot, same thing, Metropolitan, you get into like Vanishing Points, 3776, you know, I'm mixing up the two brands now, but you know what I mean. Um, there's a lot of pens that can kind of walk people up from I just discovered fountain pens to I want to get the next level pen, now I want a gold mint pen, and now I want to get into the collectible kind of stuff. Aurora's kind of like, you got to be pretty bought into the whole fountain pen concept to get into most of their pens. Um, and that's, I think that's definitely a huge uh, factor here. But they're working on it, you know, they're, they're very established. They're actually a you know larger company, I think, than uh, both Panider and Visconti, uh, but it's just, you know, they're, they're catering to people that have kind of been around in the, the pen world for a while. So this is something that I'm talking with, that Kenra is talking with them. We're trying to get, okay, how do we tell the story of Aurora a little better here in the U.S.? So it's good that you asked it. That's why I want to take this question, throw a little love to Aurora because their pens are extremely reliable. The quality is actually very consistent. Um, and they do come out with some really nice looking stuff like this, like this, uh, this Natuno here is, looks phenomenal. So there you go. Check out Aurora. They got some cool stuff going on. All right, I got a paper question for you. Not so much a paper, more of a notebook question, but it fits, fits into the category. Um, from Radical X Edward on Twitter, I've really been wanting to know since I got my traveler's notebook, has Brian ever gotten ink on his notebook? And since I'm so paranoid about it happening to me, is there anything that can be done to clean it without ruining it if that happens? I get ink on myself constantly. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you know, part of it, honestly, I think I've spilled ink on it, but I've never really had like major stains. I think I have this one tiny little dot here. Maybe that had some ink, but I can't tell. Maybe that's more of a ding or a dent. That might actually be what it is. I know I've spilled ink on this one before, um, and I just wiped it off. Uh, with a paper towel and then just a little bit of water even just like spit in my thumb and I just kind of rub it off and that honestly it either gets it off or it blends it up enough where it doesn't really make a difference. I haven't like dumped a half a bottle onto my notebook before um, but just in normal use I've been carrying this one for several years I've had this one for like six years or so um, and I haven't really spilled a whole lot of ink on it or if I have it's wiped off just fine and not been a big deal. I think if you had maybe a bulletproof ink or something that was, you know, um, cellulose reactive and it would get on this leather, maybe that would be a little more of a challenge. Let me see if I spilled it on the inside. Maybe I've gotten ink on the inside. This one's fine. No. Let me see if I've gotten any. No, that's fine. I imagine the inside you'd have more of a tendency to stain because it's just, it's more of the raw uh, suede there. Um, but the outside is, you know, it's gonna have a little bit of a finish to it, so. I really haven't had any issues with ink on here. So I, I can't give you like full guarantee that it's gonna be fine, but I've never in my practical use 
um, had an ink stain that has been permanent on here. Um, that said, I want to, I partly wanted to, to say that, and I partly wanted to also encourage you a little bit that like these notebooks are made to be used. They're made to be carried around. They're made to get all the little dings and scratches and stuff like that on them. Like, like this kind of stuff, it, you gotta, to some level, I think embrace it just a little bit because that's part of what these are. They gain character. It's like any other leather good. Um, you know, I mean, some things you want to try and keep looking perfect, but honestly, these are made to be tossed around, shoved in a backpack, thrown in your car seat. You know, you drop it on the ground like, it's okay if it gets a little dirty, if it gets a little messy, you know? I put an orange band on mine. It doesn't come with an orange band, but I put an orange band on mine. I wanted to personalize it. I want it to be mine. You know, if you get a little wear on it, to me, that is actually a benefit because that means you are using, you are loving, you are living life with your notebook. And that's part of a notebook that's in the traveler's spirit, in my opinion. Not everybody feels that way, but that's the approach that I take towards it. So whether or not you choose to kind of adopt that mindset about it, I would encourage you to at least consider that as a possibility and maybe just think about that. Maybe that'll, uh, you know, open up a new world for you and not, you know, there's a lot of things in this world that you could be paranoid about. That's probably one that you could let go, focus on some bigger things in my opinion, but you know, to each your own. I think, uh, in terms of like cleaning products and stuff like that, I, I haven't really tried a lot of like leather cleaners or anything like that on these notebooks. You know, I know that they are, you know, they're, they're pure leather. So pretty much any like well-known reputable leather cleaner uh, would be the way to go uh, for that. Uh, but I've only ever used like water and a paper towel and just use that and that's been enough for me. So I hope that helps you out. Maybe not as thorough as what you wanted, but that is what I got for you, okay? Personal question, this is from Savannah S. on Facebook. How do you find local fountain pen peeps? I know there's gotta be more pen people around here, but I feel alone. Savannah, oh, just wanna like give you a friend here. Um, okay, so, you know, most of us, just to give you a little comfort, most of us feel alone in the pen world. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, we're all that like one weird pen person in our office, right? Um, but I promise you that there are others around you that are into fountain pens. Some of it is gonna be just using your fountain pens in public. You'd be amazed how many people you can connect with. And, and there's this cool thing in the fountain pen community where if you're just using a fountain pen out in the real world, or you see somebody using a fountain pen, it's totally cool, whatever walk of life, whatever situation you're in, to say, hey, is that a Lamy Safari? You know, I've got, I've got one of those in blue or whatever. And you can just go up and start talking to people. If they're pen fans, they're gonna love talking to you about their pens because we're all that one weird pen person. So if we come across somebody else, we're like, hey, you know, it's like you may not become their best friend instantly, but you, you could, you never know. It's amazing. Whenever I've done like pen meetups or anything like that, people from every walk of life come together and they start talking about pens and it's like, no matter what, you've got an instant bond with that person because we're all passionate about these things, right? So that's one cool thing. You can walk up to strangers. Maybe that's not your thing, that's fine, but I would encourage you to maybe just try or just use yours and let other people walk up to you. Um, but if you wanna connect more virtually, um, Facebook can be a great place to connect to people. Um, you can start meetups and events and you can kind of actually coordinate things there, um, which is really good. And you can tack on other people's things. You can look you know, in your area and see what events are going on. Um, you can reach out through private groups like Goulet Nation or you know, like the Fountain Pen Network Facebook group. Um, you can join these groups and then you can say, hey, I live in the Des Moines area. Does anybody want to get together, do a pen meetup? Is there anything else already happening? Or you say, hey, I'm gonna be visiting in Washington, D.C. for this week, is there a pen meetup? Does anybody wanna meet up, whatever? Uh, you'd be amazed uh, how many people could wanna connect through something like that. Um, there's you know, Reddit, Fountain Pen Network, the actual Fountain Pen Network forum, there's Pen Addict Slack, um, or you could just Google your city name with Pen Club. There might already be a pen club in there. You might find a blog or a website or something like that, or a Facebook group link or something that's already happening in your area. So just do a little research there. Google can be your friend. Um, and that might be a way to get together with other people. Um, if there's a pen show that's near you, that can be a great place because a lot of groups, local groups or clubs or whatever will gravitate towards whatever the closest pen show. Um, you know, for example, I live in the Richmond area and there's a DC pen show. Well, there's a DC pen like a group that always goes there and there's a Richmond pen club 
that will you know gather together there. Um, it's a great place that naturally draws a lot of pen people together. So look if there's anywhere that's within you know your state or even close by. Um, I know not every state has a pen show, but there's probably 13 or 15 different pen shows every year um, around the country. So there's probably something somewhat near you uh, that might be worth looking at. Uh, but take heart, there are other people around you who are into pens. I know you can find them if you do a little bit of work. Um, but yeah, or just ask around on various social media channels and see. But I think if you concentrate yourself around those places where pen people gather and then just ask, you might be surprised what you find. All right, I'm going to close out with a couple of business questions. One is from Christopher L. on Facebook. In some other hobbies, there's a phenomenon called cult of the new. It refers to people who spend inordinate amounts of money on products that are very heavily marketed on Kickstarter or at conventions, but after receiving the product, they find that it's fairly mediocre for the price. Gets used once or twice, shelved, and never used again. However, there's always a ton of industry hype surrounding these releases or things like limited editions, add-ons, and Kickstarter to convince people to continually be buying these. My question is, do you see this problem occurring in the fountain pen world? I mean, every new pen seems like it is the greatest thing ever in marketing, as it should, makes many people feel like they need to have it. What guidance can you give to help people be more discerning or selective about what pens, ink, etc., that they buy so they don't end up buying tons of pens that they'll never use? Um, Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, this happens. Uh, look, believe me, I, of all people, could be in a position to tell you that every pen is the latest and greatest thing ever to come out. Um, I think what you're talking about here, especially talking about Kickstarter and all that, there is a whole vibe of like, almost like World's Fair type of, <laughs> you know, like hype of like, hey, come here, see, this is the greatest thing that's ever been invented. Uh, a bit of that vibe that can come across, I really try hard not to like oversell things. You know, it's like even talking about this Aurora, I'm like, it's an $800 pen. It's not gonna be for everybody. If you like the 88, it's got some features, piston, all that kind of stuff is cool. Beautiful color. It's a new color. It's 100th anniversary. It's kind of cool to partake in that. That's the selling thing, but it's definitely not like, oh man, if you get the 88, let me tell you, this is gonna change your life. No, that's not gonna happen. Most of them, probably not. Um, but definitely I know where you're coming from because I've seen this on Kickstarter. I especially see it with people that really aren't that plugged in to the fountain pen scene, but they maybe come from a tangential industry or they've done a bunch of other Kickstarters. They, they're they new to kind of the fountain pen thing and they, especially on Kickstarter because you haven't necessarily developed the product yet, they get really excited about the idea of a fountain pen that has some design element or something or some shape that to them is like, this is the sleekest, you know, uniquest thing. And you're like, that was done in 1930 or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like people that really know about fountain pens. You're like, that has already been done. You just, you're not super plugged into the pen world. So you think it's this new revolutionary thing. Um, that's more kind of what I see. Or it's like, somebody's like, oh, this, this fountain pen, it's made of titanium. And you're like, there's a lot of titanium fountain pens out there to be quite honest with you, especially on Kickstarter. But it's like sleek video and all this kind of stuff. So I, I totally know where you're coming from. I don't think that most people in the fountain pen world are really serving up a lot of that. I see some of that on like Kickstarter, Indiegogo of people that maybe are plugged more into that cult of new and some of that spills over a little bit into the fountain pen world. Uh, and then probably people that aren't that plugged into fountain pens then discover kind of and get and get into the hype and then we'll fall into that. But I don't think most people who are like deeply into the fountain pen world are really buying into it all that much. Um, I, I definitely see plenty of people that will get excited about pen after pen after pen after pen. A lot of it has to do with, um, you know, not and getting off of like Kickstarter for a second, people that will buy a bunch of different fountain pens. A lot of it is because things are exciting and, and they see stuff on Gilly Nation or they see stuff on, on Pen Attic Slack or Reddit or whatever. Everybody gets all excited about whatever the latest Twisby or something like that. And it turns out it's just not the pen for them or maybe in the, and they get kind of bought into the hype a little bit. And then over time they kind of mature and they're like, no, this really isn't, this really isn't what I want. I really want this other style of pen or I'm kind of, people kind of come into their own and settle into it. And that's, that's actually pretty normal. I don't know that that's necessarily like an overhype thing. I think there's an excitement and a passion around fountain pens in general that is infectious. You know, if you're sitting here, however many, what, 49 minutes into episode 252 of Brian's talking about pens again, um, then you're probably 
pretty bought in and you, you feed off the passion and stuff. And, and so there's a certain amount of influence that comes with that passion. Um, but over the long haul, I know that if I overhype things, I'm going to be discredited in the pen world um, for being a, a hype machine, you know, or a sales, a sales person. Um, I'm really not trying to have that be, um, you know, the main thing. Like th there's going to be some of that. Yes, I sell pens. Big disclaimer. I sell pens for a living. <laughs> so if you're buying my pens, you know, that's how this whole thing, that's how this whole thing works. I benefit from that financially. I pay my team. I you know, feed my kids off of all that. So yes, there is a benefit to me doing that. But at the root of it, I try always to educate, talk about the value of things. And then ultimately, I want you to be happy in the long term. To me, the most important thing is to make sure that fountain pens as a whole, as an industry, as a tool available to you to enhance your life, are going to be around for a very long time. And that is not going to be sustained very easily by flash in the pan, overhype, lots of marketing, and then there's not a lot of substance. Um, there's something that I, I don't remember the, the source of it, but there was something in a, in a book I read or somewhere I picked up along the way that when you're talking about sales or developing a product, you want it to be at home good. And this concept of at home good is not like when you buy it in a store, or when you buy it online, but then when you actually open it up, you start to use it, it feels good and it actually gets better as you are actually using it at home. I want things to be at home good. That's really why I talk so much about pens and educate so much is because I want you to do a lot of the research and thinking and stuff ahead of time without buying anything yet. And then after you've learned a lot and you're like, yeah, you know what? I've thought about it for six months and that diplomat arrow, because it's what I have handy to grab here, this really, this really I think is gonna meet all of my needs based on everything I know and the number of videos I've watched. I think that's gonna be the one. And then you get it and you're like, this is it. This is really, really cool. And it fulfills you. Like, I would rather you have that than sell you 16 other pens that you shove away in a drawer and never use again. Because long term, that's not going to be the best thing. So anyway, that's my view on it. Um, I don't want to throw everybody on the bus. That's not like a Kickstarter thing is that bad. There's some of that going on. But also, like companies like uh, Keras Customs, they got their start on Kickstarter. They didn't start in the fountain pen world. They started making fountain pens and found it kind of tapped into the passion of the fountain pen world on there. And that's actually kind of shaped the direction that they've moved their company. They've done a number of different Kickstarters. It's a great way to get some funding um, for a more speculative product. And they discovered the community. Now they're in pen shows. They're, they're doing that kind of stuff. So, you know, props to them. We carried their pens for a couple of years. We've, we're taking a little break with them right now um, because they're refocusing a little bit. But, you know, that's been a success story coming out of Kickstarter. Um, I think Knock has had sort of a same kind of more grassroots kind of thing. So, like, there's a lot of good things that can come out of those types of uh, the cult of new vibe. But if that's the intention and that's really what you're feeding into, yeah, I mean, of course, it's going to be it's going to be kind of an empty uh, situation there. And honestly, if you're honest with yourself, you can read it. You can, you can read what is going to be into that pretty quickly um, on these different things. So, you know, I have bought a, a few different things from Kickstarter, a few different pens, because I just kind of want to keep my tabs on things. Um, and I want to see like, oh, okay, this, this does look kind of interesting, but I know it's going to be like a year before, because I know how hard it is to make pens. So I see like, oh yeah, Kickstarter. And I'm like, this is gonna this is gonna run late, no question. And then it runs like nine months late, and I'm like, yep, <laughs> that happened because they're gonna get delayed on nibs because they don't know how long it takes to get nibs. Uh, and I'm like, yep, there you go. Or they get it and they have the wrong type of converter, and I'm like, yep, could have told you that. Uh, but anyway, this is that's kind of funny stuff. But um, you know, I think um, you know if you're gonna support any of those things on Kickstarter or any of these programs, you know, it's really good to do that. But it's especially in the fountain pen world, like. These have been around for 150 years. There's nothing, I mean, there's some technology, like somebody could come out of the woodworks and just really just come up with something cool and creative and new. That's great. I always want to leave room for that. Um, but most of what I've seen on there has just been a slight tweaking or a different take or a different design element on something that largely is a fountain pen that, you know, already exists in some other fashion. Um, but I think more it's like, think of it as I'm buying this product to support this company or I'm buying this product to really give somebody, I like their story. I want to support them as a company, like a Keras Customs type. Um, I like them. I want to see them grow and develop more stuff. And I think this product is pretty cool. Don't think of it so much as like, oh my gosh, this, this fountain pen, you can use different color inks with it. Whoa, 
You know, it's like, well, that's every fountain pen, you know, but they just like jazz it up, make it sound really nice. Um, so anyway, don't buy because it it's the latest gadget. Buy because you want to support the company. Last question I have for you this week. Oh my gosh, it's 3.30. Okay, I'm going to be super quick on this one. <laughs> From Mark H. on Facebook. Have you ever fired a customer? Has anyone done something such as verbally harassed a team member that made it worth turning down any of their business? Uh, yeah, I've had that happen. <laughs> I've had that happen num numerous times. It's not a ton. It's not super often that happens. And most people, when they're you know, most people when they're they're getting a little out of hand, if you let them know that they're getting out of hand and kind of bring them back a little bit, um, they'll be civil. Some people fly off the handle or are just wildly inappropriate. That's really what we're talking about here. Um, I've never flown off the handle. I've never yelled at a customer or anything like that. I always try to maintain a professional approach towards customers because you know, there's a phrase that you don't crap where you eat. Like you always treat your customers with respect uh, and dignity, no matter what they have going on. Uh, I have been yelled at, I've been threatened with lawsuits. I have been told that I'm a terrible person, that I'm a terrible business person, that I've thrown my employees under the bus. I've been told just about every single thing that you could possibly imagine. Um, and I always try to keep my cool. Because I always come at it with a place of empathy. Um, especially like the more somebody flies off the handle and the more out of the blue it seems, I'm like, all right, something else in their life happened that is just really throwing them off. And I just got to kind of take it, you know. And that's difficult to do. Anyone who's been in customer service, you know. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've worked in restaurants, if you've been in any type of customer service, returns, any of that situation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just got to take it. Let them just yell at you. <laughs> and just tell, you know let them get it all out their chest. I've had that happen before. People have just unloaded, you know, or even like shot multiple emails at me or whatever it might be, it was blasting me. And then I, I hear them out, talk it out, and then they come back and they're like, I'm so sorry I treated you that way. I didn't realize how angry I was and how I came across, but my father just died. My wife just found out she has cancer. My dog just got hit by a car. I just lost my job. You name it, something like that. 90% of the time, something like that has happened. And you're able to, to talk that. So you can talk through that kind of stuff with people. Um, in the big picture, most people are very, very civil. Uh, and you can talk through that kind of stuff. But there are a certain percentage of people. And we've been in business for 10 years almost. And we've dealt with a lot of customers along the way. Some people, there's a small percentage of people that are just flat out crazy. Like they're just, they're just not capable of communicating to you in a dignified manner. Uh, and when it comes to that very small group of people, I always treat them with dignity and respect, um, but I will fire them and I will not allow them to shop in our store anymore, especially if they treat my team wrong. You can yell anything you want at me. You can tell me anything, like I can take it, like Teflon here. I've been called just about everything. But if you're talking bad to my team and you're making them feel bad, especially if it's like in an inappropriate, harassing kind of manner, or you're like dropping curse words and being really belligerent, I really don't have all that much of a tolerance for treating my team like that. Like I will defend my team first because, you know, I take the mentality of um, it's not that the customer's always right, but the customer's always the customer. Like I always keep perspective on that, and I'll tell that to my team. It's like. When, when, when it worse comes to worse, like I will not defend the customer no matter what they do uh, and then put, set my team aside. Like my team comes first. Like and I know like our, our customers, you all, you pay our bills. I never forget that. But our team has to interact over and over and over and over and over again. Our team has to feel safe and protected and cared for. I never lose perspective on that. So I will always stand behind our team when someone is being unreasonable. And I will, I will insulate them, I will protect them from having to deal with the people that truly get out of line. Now my team is very capable, they've dealt with plenty. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, the, the fountain pen world is really pretty civil. Um, but there have been times where people have been just, uh, how do I say, inappropriately affectionate towards certain members of my team. That draws a pretty clear line, because I'm like, look, we're talking about pens here, and if you're starting to talk about other things, uh, no, you can't do that. And I'll either say, you know, you're not able to talk to this team member anymore because you're showing an inappropriate level of discourse. Uh, so you can deal with these other team members, but not this one individual. Um, or just say, look, you've got a pattern 
of not being able to communicate appropriately with our team. So um, as much as we appreciate your, your business, uh, you're just not going to be able to shop with our store anymore. I've had to do that on a number of occasions. Um, and thankfully, it's never gotten too, too wild and out of hand. Um, but yeah. So that has definitely happened. Um, and then the people that, usually the people that fly off the handle, they're actually the easiest to deal with because they'll, they'll just kind of make empty threats and stuff like that. I've, I've, had, I've had people threaten some of the craziest things um, that you can imagine. But again, it's kind of like, I always come at it with a place of empathy. And if somebody's just flat out, just like speaking crazy, I'll, uh, I'll just kind of like apologize and, and hear them out. And I'll just say like, look, it doesn't sound like we're gonna be able to meet the needs that you have. And you should really just look elsewhere. Like I have no problem saying it. That's, that's when, I, when I say I'm firing, that's usually kind of how I'm going about it. Um, I never say like, you're fired. You can never shop here again. That, I would never say that, like flat out to the customer. But I would say, it doesn't sound like it, that we're able to meet the needs that you have. So I'm sorry, we're not able to do that for you. You know, this is an appropriate way to talk to our team. If this is how you want to be able to talk to people, you're not going to be able to do that with us. I'm sorry. And that's kind of where I'll draw the line. And I haven't actually had to do that in quite some time because Drew is our customer care manager. He's been here for so many years. He knows that drill. He's able to handle that stuff. And a lot of my team members, I empower them to do that too because I'm all for empowering them. And, you know, I don't want to get to the point where I train, you know, we don't have like super firm policies in place everywhere here where it's like, I'm sorry, I can't do, you're going to have to talk to my manager. And then like, you know, Drew or I have to do the dirty work. You know, it's like, we'll, we train our team about how to do uh, that type of stuff. But it does, it's funny, it's like whenever we run into that kind of situation, it almost throws my team off because so it's so rare that we deal with somebody who's that, that wild and out there. But um, yeah, there you go. So that's kind of how I approach things. Uh, my question of the week this week, I've gone over on time, go figure. Um, question of the week this week, have you ever been to a pen gathering of any kind? Uh, including a pen show, a club, a meetup, anything like that. And if, show, if so, how did you get involved? You know, I really want to be able to help Savannah out here who asked the question earlier. Um, how did you kind of get involved in, in, you know, just in general, what was that experience like? I'm kind of curious. Like physical in, in location with each other, pen meetup. Love to hear more about that. Uh, so that's what I, got, what I got for this week. You can check out a lot of the products that I've shown here on GoulayPens.com. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Love interacting with you all. Thank you so much for watching and ride on. See you in two weeks.